Okay, good hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome to the Planning for Peace of Mind Advanced Care Planning event. Just a few housekeeping items. Your attendance today is completely private to the other attendees. No one can see your face or your name and any comments or questions will only be seen by myself and the speakers. If you wish to ask a question, please type it in the chat box at the lower part of your screen or at the Q&A box. box. We can see your questions there. Um, you will also receive a notification from me allowing or asking you to unmute. Please do not unmute. I'm just enabling the feature on your computer so that you'll be able to unmute yourself at the end of all presentations to ask a question if you don't want to type the question um, in the Q&A box. Again, you're gonna get a notification from me asking me to, or asking you to unmute. Please do not unmute. This is just to enable the feature on your computer so that at the end of the event, you can ask your question. Um, again, um, thank you for joining and I'm now gonna pass it over to the social work team to start the presentation. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome. I'm Gabrielle Stander and I'm on the social work team here at CINJ. And many of you have probably heard the term advanced care planning before, but what does it actually mean? ACP, Advanced Care Planning for short, is anything you do that helps you, your family, friends, and medical team know about the care you want to receive, including, but not limited to, getting information on the types of treatments available, in other words, your care options, deciding what types of treatment you would or, or would not want to receive, sharing your personal values with your loved ones, especially what quality of life means to you, and completing advanced directives to put into writing what treatment options you would and or would not want should you be, should you be unable to speak for yourself. Next slide, please. So just to give some background on ACP, the 1990 Patient Self-Determination Act encourages everyone to decide ahead of time about the extent and types of medical care they want to accept and or refuse in the event they are unable to make these decisions due to illness. It also requires healthcare providers to ask if you have an advanced directive. And a survey conducted by the Conversation Project reported that more than nine in 10 Americans think it is important to discuss their wishes for end-of-life care. However, only three in 10 have actually had these discussions. A review of 150 studies with nearly 800,000 participants showed that 36.7% had an advanced directive. 29.35 were living wills. And proportions of patients with chronic illnesses and healthy adults who had completed advanced directives were similar. Experts recommend that hospital hospitalists engage in ACP with all patients 65 years or older instead of screening for those with serious illness. And lastly, April 16th is recognized each year as National Healthcare Decision Day. So that's coming up next Tuesday and we encourage you to keep this in mind. Next slide, please. Congress invented a process for making synthetic nitrogen fertilizer that increased food production. So in case you don't already know, you don't need a lawyer to complete an advanced directive. It can actually be witnessed by two adults who are not your healthcare proxy. If your spouse is your healthcare proxy and you become divorced or legally separated, this will be revoked. If not legally married, your partner, no matter how long you have been together, is not automatically your healthcare proxy. And if you haven't decided on a healthcare proxy yet, the priority order of persons who would be asked to make decisions for you if you could not speak on your own behalf are as follows. First, your spouse, 
partner in a civil union couple or a domestic partner, if not legally separated. Second, your child, age 18 or older. Third, a parent. Fourth, a sibling, age 18 or older. And fifth, a close friend. ACP is about what treatment and care you would and would not want. These are equally important. Next slide, please. So some other considerations are who you choose as your healthcare proxy is very important. Your proxy needs to be able to act on your wishes. That may or may not be the person with whom you are closest. If you choose someone other than the expected person, for example, your spouse, partner, or sibling, make sure everyone is aware of your decision. When you choose an unexpected person, it can be difficult to explain. So some suggestions are just be honest, clear, and keep it simple. Next slide. Beginning the conversations with your family or others about the health care proxy and advanced care planning can be very difficult, understandably. So here are some helpful phrases just to get the ball rolling. I need your help with something. I was thinking about what happened to fill in the blank, and it made me realize even though I'm okay right now, I'm worried that fill in the blank and I want to be prepared. I need to think about the future. Will you help me? And I just answered some questions about how I want the end of my life to be. I want you to see my answers and I'm wondering what your answers would be. Thank you, Gabrielle. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gabrielle. My name is Rose Lazeski. I'm a social worker here at Rutgers Cancer Institute. And um, so we're going to talk about how to prepare for um, advanced care planning. Like, how do you prepare to do your planning? Okay, so there are some things that you want to be able to think about. Um, you want to make sure that you have all the information you need about treatment options. You also want to make sure that the people who are speaking for you, the people who you choose as your proxy or alternate proxy, that they know what they need to know so they can honor your wishes. Remember, your, your proxy is your advocate. You're unable to speak for yourself. Um, if you're unable to speak your, for yourself at some point, you want somebody to be able to advocate for your wishes, right? Who do I want to share this with? That's something to think about. Who, you know, who do you want to make sure has this information, right? Um, how do I want to share it? Do I want to share it in person? Does that feel too scary? It's, um, it's important to think about how, think about these things and then take some action, right? You can take some small action, right? Just start by writing down a few things, you know, two or three things about that you want uh, about your end of life that you want your doctor, friends, family to know, right? How would you want this to be? And this would includes deal breakers. You know, you may have something that you know, look, if I was in that situation, or maybe you've said this your whole life and you're, you're, you've changed your mind about it. Maybe your whole life you've said, oh, I never wanna be on machines or whatever. And when it comes to actually writing down your wishes, you've decided, hmm, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And so this is incredibly important to make sure that your family and friends know about, because maybe they've heard you throughout the year say what you want and what you don't want. But if your decisions are somewhat different, you for sure want to make sure people know that, right? Um, and, and don't be, so when it comes to talking to your doctor and asking questions for your doctor, you'll need to ask some of the hard questions, okay? And so, you know, initially, initially I was thinking, well, don't be afraid to ask the hard questions. And then I thought, well, look, be afraid, but do it anyway, <laughs> because it's so important to make sure that you have accurate answers to these. 
um, to these questions, you know, whatever your questions may be. And think about the roadblocks that you may get um, from your doctor, uh, like pushback roadblocks from family members, from um, maybe somebody who's incredibly close to you, but um, doesn't get a vote, you know, on how you want things to be. So uh, think about, you know, sort of understand that that may happen. And then, you know, what are you going to do if that does happen? Um, not in a daunting way, but again, keeping it simple and clear and, um, you know, and making sure you're able to say what you need to say to the people who need to hear it. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a little bit difficult to read, but as, as far as advanced planning goes, um, what makes, you know, what matters to you? What brings you joy, happiness, hobbies? These are basically your quality of life details. You know, if you weren't able to, you know, what things, if you weren't able to do them would feel like your quality of life is somehow diminished, right? Um, you know, what makes each day meaningful? For example, you know, do you like spending time with family, with friends? Um, are there routines that are incredibly important to you? So again, these are quality of life details, things that, you know, that matter and in some ways sort of make your life, you know, worth living. Um, what matters to you spiritually, right? List your cultural, religious, um, spiritual uh, rituals or beliefs things that um, are important. And maybe people don't necessarily know this. You know, I remember um, having a, a conversation with someone that I had known for a very long time who had um, grown up Catholic and had had all the sacraments. And, um, you know, I asked the question because, you know, I was uh, helping them, you know, with their advanced directive. I asked the question, do you want last rites? And this person had not been to a Catholic church in a number of years. And they're like, oh, yes, I've had all the other sacraments. I want last rites. So, um, so don't assume that people know what it is that you want. It's important to sort of write down what really matters to you. Um, and then, you know, what kind of care do you want at the end of life? And similarly, where would you want to be cared for, you know, when you can no longer care for yourself? And so I think it's important to think about these things because people do worry about being a burden to family. And, um, and I, you know, my best advice there is talk about it, open communication. You will, you, you don't want to assume what somebody will and will not do for you. And you don't want to take those decisions away from them. Let, if people want to help you and you want to be with them at the end of your life, let them tell you what they can and can't handle, okay? Um, just a little bit of advice, you know, really talk about it. Um, if time were limited, what would your priorities be? You know, and this is hard to think about, but it is really important to think about. You know, this is a phase of life. It may be the last phase, yes, but it's um, unavoidable and uncomfortable but it's inevitable. And so thinking about how you want it to be so that you can have that time be the way you want it to be is incredibly valuable, even though it's hard. Next slide, please. Okay, so a comparison chart here between a um, healthcare proxy, a living will and a pulse form. And pulse forms will be reviewed in much more detail later. But um, when we're talking about um, a healthcare proxy, this is really the who, right? This is who is going to be um, speaking for me in the event I cannot speak for myself. And then the living will is the what. This is what I want, this is what I don't want, um, including you know uh, some things that you maybe add that aren't part of the living will per se. And you can add things for yourself that are incredibly important to you. You know, my living will, um, um, says that, you know, what matters to me is that I am able to have um, meaningful interactions with loved ones and my surroundings, you know, so it's kind of a deal breaker if I'm not able to have that. Um, and so you can see on this list um, what, you know, I'm not going to read it to you what the, what the list says, but it's important to realize there's a difference, you know, so the proxy is really the who, and the living will is really the what, 
what you want, what you don't want. And both of these things don't really, um, they don't really have much sway unless you're in the hospital or in a, you know, a healthcare facility. Um, if you're at home and EMS is called, they will not, they, you know, they will not necessarily, you know, abide by what's your wishes that are in an advanced directive. A pulse form is different. It's actually viable everywhere because a doctor signs it. Uh, so it has the force of a doctor's order. But again, that's going to be reviewed a little bit more um, thoroughly later. Next slide, please. So in New Jersey, we have something that's called the Combined Directive for Healthcare, right? And it includes two different, um, two, it includes two documents, the proxy directive and the instructive directive, right? And so again, this is the who and the, um, the what, and I always encourage people to do both. So in the proxy directive, you have the opportunity to choose who will make decisions for your medical care when you're not able to make those decisions. You're also able to choose a representative um, or you know, an alternate re representative or um, up to two alternate rep representatives. Um, I'm sorry, could you, thank you. Um, you don't have to have a notary. You don't have to see a lawyer. Um, this document is legal when it's signed by two witnesses um, they can't be individuals designated as healthcare proxies on the form. They've got some skin in the game. So you need to have somebody who is um, unbiased, you know, who is over the age of 18 and is basically witnessing your signature and witnessing that you are of sound mind making this decision and nobody's forcing you to do that. Um, uh, an instruction directive, the same rules apply when it comes to making it legal. You sign it in front of two witnesses and then it's legal. Um, the document, this particular document, when we're talking about a living will, that gives you specific, and that gives you the opportunity to document specific information about your wishes for your end of life care. And it clarifies wishes that um, all life sustaining treatment is to continue versus options for ending some or all treatments. You know, you decide what it is that you want, what you don't want, and that's where you put it there. Um, together, this is a very useful set of documents because the proxy is actually advocating for your wishes. So if you only do the proxy directive, then that proxy or that alternate proxy is basically making decisions for you. If you do the instruction directive, you give them um, the guidelines of what you want and what you don't want. And so they're advocating for your wishes. And sometimes that makes it a little easier on um, that person. Um, next slide, please. Okay, definitions. Uh, when we're talking about life-sustaining treatment, we're talking about anything that, um, that is life-sustaining. It's, you know, it's a medical device or a procedure that um, is increasing your life expectancy by taking over um, a function that your body was performing or restoring that function. And it can be, um, it can be a drug, it can be a medical device or a procedure. Uh, a ventilator is an example of a life-sustaining treatment. Uh, surgery, therapy, artificially provided fluids, nutrition. Um, there are things that you know can be utilized to sustain your life. Um, definition of permanently unconscious. This is when you've lost the ability to interact with your environment or it's completely unaware of your surroundings. Okay, so that for me is sort of my deal breaker, as I said earlier. Um, what is the definition of terminal condition? So terminal condition means the final stage of a fatal illness, disease, or condition, right? Um, it can be in a terminal condition, even you can, you know, be in a terminal condition, even if there isn't, um, we don't know exactly, because we never know exactly how long um, that condition will last. You don't have to have a prescribed amount of time to live, you know, less than six months or something like that to be uh, in a terminal condition. Um, next slide, please. Okay, some frequently asked questions. Can, uh, can my proxy make decisions for me if I'm unable to make my own decisions? The answer quite e easily is no, um, they cannot. Um, your proxy takes over when you are unable to make decisions for yourself. And that can be permanent or that can be temporary. You could fall, hit your head, be unconscious, and then the proxy is the person who would make medical decisions and let, until you are no longer you know, unconscious. Um, what happens if I regain the ability to make my own decisions? It's, it's back to you then. 
your decision making is back to you as soon as you regain the capacity to make your own decisions. Who should have a copy of my direct advanced directive? Well, everybody. I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody tell me I have one and it's in a drawer somewhere. So if you haven't shared it with a doctor, if you haven't given it to um, the people who are your healthcare representatives, if you haven't given it to family members and physicians and those people who give you care, um, then then it actually has no has no value because nobody knows what your wishes are. So make sure it's um, widely disseminated so that um, so that it's known who who speaks for you. And um, and I even encourage people to keep a copy in the glove box. Um, and can I cancel my advanced directive? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you can change it. It's not written in stone. You can change it anytime. And if you do, you do a new one. The old one no longer is valid. Um, and you can obviously cancel it. You know, at any time you can void your advanced directive. And um, again, because that all that decision making is all up to you. Next slide, please. So we're going to go over a sample advanced directive. And for that, um, Gabrielle um, Vitaliano is going to take over. But I just want to remind everybody that April um, the 16th is National Healthcare Decision Day. And here at Rutgers Cancer Institute, we will have a table at the Cancer Institute when, where we will be, where we have um, advanced directives that people can fill out. You can ask questions and we can help you with some of the things that um, maybe you're confused about. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So I'm going to just walk through pretty much everything that we've gone over today, um, what it looks like in a sample advanced directive. This one comes from an organization called Prepare, and you can go on their website. They have the online uh, PDF that you could download, and they also have an option where you can watch some videos and walk through it step by step with a little bit of further guidance. Um, which is very nice. So this is what the um, New Jersey Advanced Directive looks like to prepare. Um, we tend to like this one because of the visuals and it's much more in depth than the typical forms that you get from the state. So it's just a matter of preference. Um, so it comes in three parts. The first part is choosing that medical decision maker, the healthcare proxy. And the second part is making your healthcare choices, which is that instruction directive that Rose talked a little bit about, and then signatures. Um, so you can fill out both parts ideally, which is best so that you have who is making decisions for you and what you would like, what decisions you would like them to make, what instructions you have for those people. Um, but you can fill out just one if you wish um, and just making sure that everything is signed or notarized if you don't have witnesses to do that. So what should you do with this form? Share it with your friends, your family, your healthcare providers. Keep it in the glove box, like Rose said. Have copies, lots of copies, especially for the people who are enlisted in the document. Um, if you have questions, it's okay to skip over things. Bring it into your healthcare providers and review it with them. Bring it to your social worker to see if they can help you with that. Um, a lawyer can help you with this form, but it's not necessary to hire a lawyer to do that. If there's anything that you want to note that isn't a question already in this paperwork, there is a space on this form specifically that allows you to write some additional things in there. And like we said earlier, if you change your mind at any point, you can redo the advanced directive, you can rescind it. The power remains yours as long as you're making decisions for yourself. Next slide, please. So this is part one, choosing a medical decision maker. Like we've mentioned, you want to choose someone 18 years of age or older and someone that you trust and trust to carry out your wishes. Um, if you don't choose a medical decision maker, then those decisions will, your doctors will, you know, speak with your friends and family about your wishes. But this will allow you to really put someone in charge of all of that rather than having multiple people who may have conflicting opinions about what you might do. So um, the visual here on kind of the second page is some of the things that they can make decisions about, that which we want to have CPR, um, if we want to be on a breathing machine or a ventilator, dialysis, having feeding tubes, blood and water transfusion, surgery, and medicines. At the end of your life, your medical decision maker can 
make decisions without calling in a religious or spiritual leader, we could decide if we were to pass in the hospital or at home um, and decide about having an autopsy, autopsy or organ donation as well. Next slide, please. So this is the page here. This is page five. This is the page where you will um, write in who your medical decision maker or makers are. It's good to have two people. One is a backup, just in case. Um, and then at the top, it allows you to um, write if there's any decisions that you do not want them to make. So it does give you a lot of freedom with this document. And then um, on this page six here, the second page that we're showing on the screen right now, you can explain why you chose these people. You know, um, perhaps you're married, but you're choosing your sibling to be your medical decision maker. You can explain why you're doing that. Um, it also says if you want your medical decision maker to have flexibility, you want them to follow everything in this document exactly as you wrote it, or if they have some flexibility and if you trust them to have good judgment in making decisions for you. Next slide, please. And this is part two. So this is the instructions for what you would want. So you can see it's very thorough. I'm not going to go through every single piece of this, but you can see um, it asks how you would prefer to make better health decisions if you want to make those decisions on your own without any input from others, or if you like others to be involved in your care. It talks about what matters most in your life, um, your pets, your family, your friends, um, not being a burden on your family, things like that. It talks about what brings you joy, what you're looking forward to in life. So it just helps to kind of like plan ahead and think about these things. And um, on the second page here, page eight, it asks questions about what matters most for your medical care. So maybe your goal is that you want your doctor to do everything they can to keep, to keep you alive. Um, perhaps it's not. Perhaps it's, you know, you want to just remain comfortable. You really want to focus on your quality of life. And here it also talks about whether or not what that is today in your current hope, but what that might look like for you at the end of your life. So perhaps today you want everything done. But if you're in a situation where you're at the very end of your life, you want to just be comfortable. So it allows you to designate that here. Next slide, please. And this goes a little bit more in depth about what is important to you at the end of your life. Um, we're talking about things that would be difficult on your quality of life. If you're in a coma and, coma and unable to wake up and talk with your friends or family from your things Rose was mentioning earlier. Um, if you're not able to feed, bathe, or take care of yourself, if that's something that's important to you. And um, so you can just be all that there. If you were dying, where would you want to be? For some people, they want to be in a hospital. They don't want to be home and they don't want to be a burden on their family. For other people, they want to be home. I like at the bottom here, it says, what else would be important? Food, music, pets. I had someone once write that they wanted the pets to be at home in their room with them and you know a certain singer playing music so if you're someone who loves Frank Sinatra maybe you say that you want Frank Sinatra music playing while you're home um, and just making you comfortable at the end of your life and allowing the things that you've loved to be present at that time too um, and then on page 10 here it just goes a little bit more in depth about um, if you would like your medical team to try all life support treatments, like sustaining treatments at the end of your life, or if you did not want you know, to have those treatments and prefer to have a natural death. Mm -hmm. It just really goes really in depth about the, the care that you would have done at the end of your life. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, also allows you to make decisions about organ donation, autopsy, and religious or spiritual wishes. And then this page here, page 12, is where you can fill in kind of anything else that you think might have been missing from this document that is really important to you and something you would want honored at the end of your life or at a time when you are unable to speak for yourself. Next slide, please. And lastly here is part three, just signing the form. Um, so you will go through this whole document and then wait until you have your witnesses present with you to sign it. They will witness you signing the document and then they will sign on page 14. You need two witnesses. Uh, again, they 
cannot be the people who are listed in the document as your healthcare proxy or your medical decision maker, but can be pretty much anyone else. Um, and if you don't have two witnesses, you can have this done notarized, which I believe would be on the next slide. If you could please go to the next slide. Yeah. So if you don't have two witnesses, you can have it notarized instead. And um, prepare for your care. They also provide a wallet card that you can keep on you that says that you do have an advanced directive. So I think that's nice too. I think that should be it. So it's about 15 pages. It's a big document, but um, it's a lot of really good information and it allows you to really think about what you would want at the end of, at the end of your life, um, what's important to you, what matters, and give you a little bit of control at a time where you might not be able to make those decisions for yourself. And these are some resources as well. The Prepare for Your Tour link is included in here so that you can go on the website and download the PDF or walk through the online form with the videos. I find that to be very helpful, um, along with some other resources that might just be um, have really good information for you during this time. That's it for us for now, so we'll and it over to Elsie. Thanks so much. Thank you to Rose and both Gabby's from the social work team. Yes, we're going to hear from Elsie Castorio, the advanced practice nurse here at CNJ, who's going to speak about the practitioner orders for life sustaining treatment form. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. So PULSE stands for practitioner orders for life sustaining treatment. And so Pulse programs are nearly in every state and many states have other names. For example, medical orders for scope of treatment, which is most. And to find out if your state has one, go online to www.pulse.org and that web address will be on the last slide as well. So the Pulse is a form for people who already have a serious illness or are very weak and likely need medical help, it details exactly what care should be given and not given and based on your choices and wishes. So what are the differences between advanced directive and post? So the advanced directive are statements of patient intention, not medical orders. After a patient has determined they've lost decision-making capacity, those intentions are put into a set of medical orders. And the statements of the advanced directive are interpreted by your healthcare providers, your physician and your advanced practice nurse and are appropriate for anyone over 18. The pulse is appropriate for anyone with an advanced illness. It is a set of medical orders and are immediately actionable and functional and no interpretation is needed. It complements the advanced directive, it does not replace it, and it is generated by your doctor or advanced practice nurse with the patient or the surrogate who is the decision maker. So the pulse was developed so it can delineate what specific care should be administered or withheld at the present time for a specific patient as directed by the physician or advanced practice nurse. So this is your pulse form and you should have it in your packet and we're gonna go through the different sections. So we're gonna start with section A, the goals of care. And so you'll see a lot of overlapping information between the advanced um, care planning forms and the pulse because it's under the same umbrella. So as I said earlier, well, excuse me, the goals of care is not a medical order set. It just gets you thinking about the next steps in this form. 
So what is the care plan trying to achieve? Is it cure, longevity, remission? What is important to you? What makes life worth living for you? Is the goal to live as long as possible without pain and discomfort to attend a family event? So healthcare providers are encouraged to talk about the prognosis so our patients can set realistic goals to discuss the medical condition, what is likely to happen in the future and their options. And section B addresses medical interventions. So full treatment is no limitation on medical interventions and it could be appropriate to go to the intensive care unit, intubation, or if in a nursing facility, transfer to a hospital if indicated. Resuscitation status will address in section D. There is limited treatment, but it includes antibiotics and IV, IV fluids, also non-invasive non positive airway pressure, which is the delivery of oxygen through a mask or CPAP, BiPAP. Generally in limited treatment, um, the goal is to avoid intensive care, but you could um, specify a preference to be transferred to the hospital. Continuing with medical interventions, um, the option for symptom treatment only focuses on comfort, um, administration of medication, oxygen, wound care, also measures to relieve spiritual, emotional, and psychological suffering. And again, the option to transfer to the hospital if comfort cannot be achieved in other settings. Section C is artificially administered fluids, fluids and nutrition. We always want to offer our patients um, and encourage them to um, drink in and eat as much as they can tolerate if possible. The other option is artificial nutrition through a tube, IV, or perhaps a trial period of either of those. Section D, there, there's um, on the left side of the page, has to do with cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR. A person has no pulse and is not breathing. So the options would be to attempt resuscitation, CPR, or do not attempt resuscitation and allow a natural death. If you check CPR here, then in the section for full treatment, in, then for full treatment, you would select that. So in section D on the right side has to do with airway management when a person is having difficulty breathing and is with a pulse. So the options are to intubate, which is putting a tube either in the nose or the mouth and using artificial ventilation. Other option, do not intubate and use oxygen, medications for comfort. And also you can um, define a trial period of mechanical ventilation. So section E is completed only if the patient has decision-making capacity. So the patient gives permission to the surrogate, who is the decision maker, to modify or revoke the post orders. But this is done in collaboration with the physician or advanced practice nurse. So if the patient has an advanced directive and has a designated decision maker, that would also also be consistent on the post form as well.
section F has to do with signatures. And if, if it's not signed, then it, it you know, um, it's not considered complete. So the patient or the surrogate decision maker would need to sign physician, advanced practice nurse, their credentials, and, um, and also their contact numbers. So specifics of post form, it's a double-sided form. Both sides would need to be completed. The original green copy stays with the patient. And um, if you're making copies for medical records, both sides should be copied. You would want to share it with um, physicians that you see regularly, um, family and friends. You would want to keep a copy, well, not a copy, actually keep the green would stay with the patient. Um, and then you would have you would, um, have it on your person. And then if at home, you would let your family and friends know um, where you have a copy in your home. And if emergency medical personnel comes to the home, it's always convenient to have it on the refrigerator. So other key points are that this is strictly voluntary. Um, again, if the patient is in a facility and then is transferred to a hospital or is leaving the hospital and going home, the physicians and APNs are responsible for the clarification of the patient's preferences and making sure it's up to date with their wishes. And we reviewed this. We already went over this as well. Okay, and we can skip to the next slide. So in conclusion, um, there is mounting evidence that the Pulse has accomplished its intended purpose. In 2020, there was a systematic review of 10 observational studies that examined the preferences in Pulse and um, the care received and found that there was 98% agreement of patients' preferences for and against CPR, and also 98% um, with the actual delivery and withholding of resuscitation. Also, there was a 90% um, agreement regarding artificial nutri nutrition and receipt of antibiotics. So the POLS program fills in an important gap where other documents um, such as um, out-of-hospital DNR orders um, sometimes could leave patients vulnerable to unwanted resuscitation and hospitalization. So your quality of life during advanced illness should be totally under your control. So this is the um, internet address for additional information from the Pulse. And the other um, link there um, kind of um, is good messaging just to kind of drive the point home about um, making decisions for yourself ahead of time.